Hi, welcome to Asian American Life. I'm Arnabelle DeMillo. This month, we're at the Metropolitan Museum of Art Costume Institute. It took two years to produce China Through a Looking Glass, an exhibit that highlights China's fashion and art influence in the Western world. Let's take a look at this spectacular exhibit. The exhibit opened with a star-studded press conference with the exhibit's collaborators. With China Through the Looking Glass, we have tried our best to encapsulate over a century of cultural interplay between the East and the West that has equally inspired and informed. It is a celebration of fashion, cinema, and creative liberty. Later that night, the stars were out for the annual Met Gala. Fashionistas, along with Hollywood's royalty, walked the red carpet, wearing Asian-inspired ball gowns, from the understated to the eclectic like Rihanna's much-talked-about dress by one of China's most famous fashion designers. China Through the Looking Glass is one of the Met's largest endeavors, a collaboration between the Met's Costume Institute and the Asian Art Galleries. This is the Met's first exhibition backed financially by Chinese donors. It takes up three floors, a total of 30,000 square feet. It's three times larger than any previous Costume Institute exhibit. Visitors will find more than 150 costumes and accessories. More than 40 fashion designers represented from haute couture to ready to wear, all alongside the Met's famous Asian arts collection. This ambitious undertaking explores the impact and influence of China's aesthetics on the imagination of Western fashion designers, including Ralph Lauren, Christian Dior, and Roberto Cavalli. The underlying premise of the exhibition is really very simple. It's about the creative process. Artists make connections. That's what they do. They're not inhibited by barriers of time or space or culture. They embrace influences even if they don't fully understand them. Or rather, they understand these things in their own way to solve their own creative challenges. Visitors take a journey through a different time period including Imperial China, 1920s Shanghai, the People's Republic of China, their cinematic-inspired fashion of anime Wong, and artistry of filmmaker Zhang Zimou's Raise the Red Lantern. Playing in this corridor are scenes from The Last Emperor of China, where you'll also find the real child's robe worn by The Last Emperor. Each room will have what the curator calls a mirrored reflection of time and space, inspired by Alice in Wonderland. Like Alice's make-believe world, the China reflected in the fashions in the exhibition is a fictional, fabulous invention, offering an alternate reality with a dreamlike, almost hallucinatory illogic. The show is not about China per se, but about a collective fantasy of China. I'm Minnie Ro, and Asui has built a global empire of clothing, fragrance, and makeup to become one of the most versatile designers of our time. Sui shares her secrets to her longevity in the industry. Anna Sui's signature look is the baby doll bohemian hippie style, soft and feminine with a rock and roll edge. Hello. Hi. How, how are, are you? you? It's nice to, nice meet, to you. meet you. Please sit down. We met Anna Sui in her showroom in New York City's Garment District, which was decorated in the same vibrant, eclectic style as her fashion line. Everything about Sui reflects her immense curiosity in the world and the latest cultural trends. Whatever catches my eye, whatever kind of um, interests me, somehow it creeps into the collection and it could take it to a new twist and give it like a kind of unexpected style. You kind of absorb the color palettes and the patterning, and sometimes you go back and reflect on it and put it in the collection. Sometimes it's immediate, sometimes it could show up five years later. From Asian inspiration to swinging London in the 60s and 70s to Nordic Viking influences, Sui says she is constantly changing and pushing herself to the limit. It's what keeps her fashions in demand in this ultra-competitive industry. It's a tough field. It's, it's, it's a huge challenge. And 
There's always somebody new. You have to like recreate yourself every single season and really question what you're doing, really um, evolve it and move it forward and keep it relevant. Her path to success is a classic American dream story. Sui was born and raised in suburban Detroit, a world away from the glamorous New York existence she lives today. Her Chinese parents, who met as students in France, had moved to the U.S., where her father pursued a master's degree at the University of Michigan. My parents were very liberated Chinese. I think that both of them came from families that uh, weren't so super traditional. Sui says the fashion bug bit her early on. I said to my parents, when I grow up, I'm going to live in New York and I'm going to be a fashion designer. From that moment on, Sui was single-minded in her drive to make it happen, learning how to sew from her mother, taking home economics classes at school, and pouring through magazines like Seventeen that belonged to her babysitters. In the back of Seventeen, there was an article, or not, not an article, an ad for Parsons School of Design. But I had read an article in Life magazine about two young ladies that went to Parsons, and when they graduated, they went to Paris, and Elizabeth Taylor opened a boutique for them. So I thought, oh, okay, I have to go to Parsons. That's, that's the key. So she packed her bags, moved to New York, and went to Parsons School of Design. Years later, she found out that the young lady in the story was actually the stepdaughter of photographer Irving Penn. So while there was no Elizabeth Taylor waiting to open a boutique for her after graduation, Sui points to another celebrity who kickstarted her career, Madonna. I went to the Paris shows with my friend Stephen Mizell, and we uh, ended up going to the first show with Madonna. And like she came out of her, her uh, hotel room with her coat on, and I didn't see what she was wearing, but when she sat down at the Gaultier show, she took off her coat and she said, Anna, I've got a surprise for you. And she was wearing my dress. And that was one of the things that kind of gave me some confidence because in her hotel room, it was racks and racks of Paris designers that people had just sent her clothes. Sui returned to New York and premiered her first runway show. The year was 1991, and Sui has been unstoppable ever since. Her empire spans four continents. Her newest store in Seoul, South Korea, opened in 2014, joining 50 other boutiques in Japan, England, Australia, even Azerbaijan, as well as the one that started it all in Soho, New York. Her clothing line expanded into fragrance, accessories, cosmetics, shoes. She has partnered with Coach, Toomey, and Target to create items bearing her name. This is one of my favorites from this season. Despite her success and reputation of being one of the first female Asian American designers, Sui remains humble saying she does not consider herself a pioneer. Rather, she focuses on just being the best she can be. The challenge wasn't that I was Asian. It wasn't that I was a woman. It was just that I had to be a good designer. And she has no plans to slow down anytime soon. I work just as hard as I do did when I first started my business. You know, I'm usually the first one in the office and the last one to leave. Um, I work a lot on the weekends. And that work ethic has paid off, as several of Sui's designs, including this one, are featured at the annual Metropolitan Museum of Art costume exhibit. It is one of the highest honors for a designer. I'm Minnie Rowe for Asian American Life. Sen Kuang Chi has a solo show of his photographs here at the Gray Art Gallery in Manhattan. I'm Paul Lin. It's the first such retrospective for Tseng, who died in 1990 of AIDS, but left a decade's worth of work. I am an inquisitive traveler, a witness of my time, and an ambiguous ambassador. 
Based in New York, Tseng photographed from 1979 to 1989, often traveling to make self-portraits in front of famous landmarks. Today, the pictures seem as fresh as when they were taken. Gray Art Gallery's director says Tseng pushed photography's boundaries. This is one of my favorites because he is t being very active. He's taking this iconic image of Notre Dame in Paris, and he's actively walking into our space. Tseng studied both painting and photography in Paris, gaining a formal sense of composition and technical expertise with the camera. When he got to New York, he struck upon self-portraits, well before cell phones could take selfies and people could add digital backdrops. We have to remember that during this time, he was really doing the work with analog film, pre-digital. This is no Photoshop. And so it required him going out with the camera to visit all the different sites, setting the camera up, and taking the self-portraits. A lot of effort for a man wearing the kind of suit once favored by Mao Zedong, his face often emotionless, and an ID tag bearing just two words, visitor, in English and French. It seems to add up to something, but we're not sure what. He's playing on who am I. Um, these are self-portraits, yet you don't know anything about him. And he remains mysterious and enigmatic. And that's the paradox behind the work. Tsang and his sister actually grew up in Hong Kong in the 1950s. His family had left China when Mao swept into power. Even early on, Tsang was a prodigy in Chinese painting and calligraphy. He also had a zest for life. One Chinese New Year, he held a lit firecracker in his fingers on a dare until the firecracker blew off his thumb, actually. And um, I think that describes him very well, like almost a firecracker of a personality. The history of the suit sheds more light on Tseng and his art. Muna says he actually bought it at a second-hand shop, and the first time he ever wore it was 1978, when he and Muna went to dinner with their parents at Windows on the World. They were not amused. And when he arrived at the restaurant with my parents and myself, the maitre d' took one look at him and treated him like a Chinese dignitary, a VIP. Something clicked in his mind and he thought, wow, this suit has power. Tseng soon realized how the suit could help him access places he might not otherwise enter, from a big parade to a gala at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, meeting celebrities like Paloma Picasso, Andy Warhol, even Yves Saint Laurent. Yves Saint Laurent said to him, quite mystified, you speak French so well, you must be an ambassador from China. Tseng's sense of adventure and love of life and art fit in well with a group of artists he met in New York, from a young singer named Madonna to graffiti artists like Jean-Michel Basquiat and Keith Haring. They all found New York to be where they could meet kindred souls and do the things that perhaps would have been considered weird or not socially acceptable in a sense. Um, they had a lot of fun. And they saw this as part of their art, partying. And Quan Chi also, as an accomplished photographer, also did a lot of editorial work and he took portraits of artists, so he knew how to take portraits. And here he poses a bunch of friends. As an insider among East Village artists, Tseng had the access and the skills to document a rapidly vanishing time and a community decimated by AIDS. Toward the end of his career, Tseng, a gay Asian artist, was dying too. You start to sense that in his later work. His figure becomes smaller and smaller, like in Lake Nineveh, Vermont, one of Muna's favorites. Perhaps there's a bigger message there as well um, of Chinese philosophy, of the man in the sky and the earth, a more universal concept of the artist's ego kind of fading into a harmony with the more universal picture. Muna, a dancer by training, choreographed an homage to her brother in which she acts out, in dance, parts of her brother's life. By the end, though, he's gone and she expresses her own feelings of loss and love. So what of Tseng's legacy? At this point, even the Metropolitan Museum of Art has acknowledged and honored Tseng at its latest costume gala, 35 years after he crashed it. And then there's this retrospective show. More than 700 people attended the opening, many seeing the work for the first time. I've had young people come up and say, oh my god, 
this is incredible. This is so fresh. We can't believe it's from the 1980s. And that gives hope. It's great to know that his legacy lives on and can still be inspiring. This show has over 80 works, but it provides just a glimpse into Tseng Kuang Chi's life and work and the 80s art world. He left more than 100,000 photographs and an inspirational legacy that continues to influence many other artists to this day. I'm Paul Lin for Asian American Life. Ava Chen is a rising star in the fashion magazine industry. She's the youngest editor at Condé Nast, and she's the first Asian-American editor-in-chief of Lucky Magazine. I sat down with her recently to talk about the business of fashion. Ava Chen has a shoe obsession. If you're one of her 366,000 followers on Instagram, you'll find her footwear a favorite subject, along with fashion, food, selfies with celebrities, and her baby daughter. The fashion editor is a self-admitted Sharaholic who gets social media's new role in today's changing media landscape. We're living in this crazy fast-paced society right now where you're only as relevant as your last tweet, your last Instagram, and as a brand, you know, it's really important to be able to think about things at that crazy fast pace. For me, the most valuable part of social media is that I, ha I feel like I have um, a built-in focus group and I know that what people are interested in, the questions that people have. Hey universe, get ready because I'm in a jumpsuit. And people are interested in her. It's one reason this former pre-med New Yorker rose swiftly to the top of the highly competitive world of magazine publishing. In the summer of 2013, she was named editor-in-chief of Lucky Magazine the youngest editor at a fashion magazine, and the first Asian American at the top of a Condé Nast masthead. It was a surprise to me, actually, you know, that, that, that I am in this role. I think it's amazing and I'm so grateful for the opportunity that I've been given. Of course it came with pressure, you know. I think that anytime someone takes a big step forward or steps into any kind of visible role, it comes with it pressure and kind of um, haters and kind of like just negativity in general. Chen did not set out to be a fashion editor. She's a native New Yorker. She grew up in Greenwich Village, first generation Asian American. She jokes that she was a dutiful Asian daughter. She was pre-med at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore on her way to becoming a doctor. I thought there was medicine, there was law, there was engineering, and then there was finance. Those were the four careers that I always just thought but all that changed the summer between her junior and senior year. This was for my summer off. The summer between my junior and senior year, I wanted to do something kind of fun and just totally different because every single summer, like I imagine a dutiful Asian child, I had been in summer school or in kind of like science camp or you know interning at a lab or working at a doctor's office. So I wanted to do something completely crazy for that one summer between junior and senior year. She applied for several media internships. She got several offers, but the only ones that paid were the fashion magazine internships. So she accepted one, and well, the rest is history. Soon after college, she landed a job at Lucky Magazine writing credits. She then moved on to Elle Magazine, then Teen Vogue. Then in 2013, Condé Nast named her editor-in-chief of Lucky. The media dubbed her the first digital native to rise to the top. She was one of the few top editors who interacted directly with readers. Having that day-to-day -day dialogue with people, um, especially the readers, especially my followers, um, and having them be able to ask me questions and answer, it sounds incredibly weird, but having a small impact on someone's life like, really makes a difference to me. Chen has more than 100,000 followers on Twitter and more than 366,000 on Instagram. And I think we're living in a completely day and age right now of um, magazines, of media, and um, that kind of sense of, uh, you know, having a curtain or having a wall between you and the reader, and it's an edict, like you have to wear this kind of shoe, okay, like we're telling you, and we don't want to hear back from you, no thanks. I think that's completely gone. While Chen doesn't like the word role model, she is seen as one, especially by young Asian Americans who aspire to be just like her. Apex recently honored her for her contributions to the Asian community. 
I recently got involved with an organization called Apex, which is an um, organization that does after-school programs on the Lower East Side. I think that there's a misperception all Asians are model minorities. Everyone goes to Harvard, Princeton, and Yale and is from an upper-middle-class family, when actually so many Asians, especially in New York City, live below the poverty line, don't go to college, have two parents who can barely make ends meet. And so this program provides a place for these kids to go to. She also has plans to move on. After months of speculation, Chen recently announced on Twitter that she would be departing Lucky. For Chen, it is the beginning of a new chapter in her life. She won't reveal where she's going, but says she has a little someone who will be keeping her busy. My immediate kind of what's next is spending some time with my daughter. I just had a baby, you know, just about five months ago and kind of gobbling up her deliciousness, you know, is a priority for me. I'm Erna Beldamillo for Asian American Life. Fashion model Gina Rosero's story is going viral. You've probably seen her in Glamour magazine or making the talk show rounds. She's an advocate for transgender rights, and she shared her inspirational story with me. Her story is a familiar one. Moved to New York to pursue a modeling career. In 2005, I made the decision to move to New York City. I didn't know a lot of people in New York, but I just thought that it was a worth risk to follow my dream. This is really what I wanted to do. I will go for it. For Gina Rosero, it was worth the risk. She was discovered by a photographer, signed with an agent, and was booking shoots. But Rosero kept a secret from most people she had met in New York. I made the decision to take this as an opportunity to have this almost like a refresh button. I didn't want to always have to constantly tell about my journey of what I've gone through. My agents did not know about my, my history. My closest friends knew, but like a lot of the colleagues and acquaintance did not know about my history. I just want to be a model, a woman, someone who's moved to New York and pursuing a dream. Rosero's story starts thousands of miles away in the Philippines. In her words, she was assigned boy at birth. I had that very clear moment when I was five years old. I would always wear the t-shirt or the towel on my head and drape it on my back. And I would walk around the house all day wearing that. And there was a moment when my mom actually asked me saying, how come you always wear that t-shirt in your head? I said, mom, this is my hair. I'm a girl. Rosero embraced the woman inside her and entered a transgender beauty pageant popular in the Philippines. In the Philippines, there's a lot of beauty pageant for transgender women. In the month of May, there's always a fiesta celebration somewhere almost every day. And during those fiesta celebrations, there's usually a dance contest, a singing contest, and, you know, a pageant for transgender women. Her first pageant, where she won best in swimsuit and best in long gown, changed her life. That night really changed my life. It really did change my life because after that, it was just full expression of my femininity. And there are going to be more major life changes, the biggest one of all, when her mom, who has always been one of her biggest supporters, called to tell her her U.S. visa was approved. You really want to be recognized as a woman, right? And she researched that there was a law that, that would allow me to change my name and gender marker in the United States. So that really set the path for me. First, she traveled to Thailand for the surgery, and she officially became Gina Rosero. Was that a tough decision for you to actually have the surgery? Because no. it made it permanent. No. No. That's what I wanted to do. So I researched who the surgeon was, but um, that was my life's, one of my life's goals. There is a dichotomy in the Philippines. A majority of the country is devoutly Catholic and conservative, but it is also a country with a cultural history of LGBTQ tolerance. It is ranked as one of the gay-friendly nations in the world and Asia. In fact, transgender mythical characters are found throughout Asian literature and oral storytelling. In that part of the world, this has been part of the culture, thousands of years civilization. There's a Buddhist goddess of compassion, Guan Yin. There's an Indian Hijra goddess. So this existed for such a long time, and it exists until now. It's still celebrated, but not politically recognized. 
There is an estimated 50 million transgender men and women worldwide. In the U.S., about 700,000. And because the transgender population is still the most marginalized and invisible group in the Asian community and in many parts of the world, Rosero, after living nine years quietly as a woman, decided it was time to tell her secret. And she did it in a big way. For the last nine years, some of my neighbors, some of my friends, colleagues, even my agent did not know about my history. I think in mystery, this is called the reveal. Here is mine. I was assigned boy at birth based on the appearance of my genitalia. Her revelations went viral on YouTube. Almost overnight, she became the unofficial spokesperson for transgender men and women, young and old worldwide. I've been really blessed with the support system. I, I, I feel that, you know, I've been lucky to have had an amazing support system with my family and my friends. I always been conscious of this, of this blessing that I've always thought that I would give back in a big way in the community. From her TED Talk, Gender Proud was born. The nonprofit's mission is to help give a voice to the transgender population. From state to state, country to country, the laws vary when it comes to gender assignment. What we're trying to create is um, global unified messaging, why it's important for countries around the world to adopt gender recognition policy. What that means is it would allow transgender people and gender variant people to change name and gender marker without being forced to go through surgeries. Because right now there's only a handful of countries that allow you to do that. Since her revelation, she has been working nonstop. She was featured in Marriott International's Love Travels campaign. She was also in the October issue of Glamour magazine and walked the runway for Carmen Mark Valvo during New York's Fashion Week. For Rosero, her new assignment is clear. She has become an outspoken supporter of transgender rights and an inspiration to others just like her. I'm Ernabel DeMillo for Asian American Life. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. That's our show for now. Be sure to stop by the Metropolitan Museum of Art Costume Institute, China Through a Looking Glass. The exhibit will be here through August 16. I'm Ernabel DeMillo. We'll see you next month on Asian American Life.